Uh, hi everyone, welcome to Millennial Think Tank. Tonight we are talking, we're going back to gaming. We're going to talk about the theory behind gaming and why it is, um, why it's so popular and also <clears throat> addiction in gaming because we're, they're connected. So <clears throat> last week I talked about the stats of gaming and the one interesting one was that uh, Gen Z, you know, the youngest generation, 100% of boys and 94% of girls are playing some sort of game. Uh, and e I'm just going to revisit this because it still, still fascinates me that Gen X is the largest population of gamers. Um, even bigger than millennials. More, and considering that Gen X is so small compared to millennials, there are 56 million Gen Xers and 80 million millennials, but there are still more Gen Xers gaming. So I, I just think that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so one of the things I want to discuss is I went to a website called Think, Play, Feel. And Barry and Jackie, are you familiar with that at all, what it is? I may have heard it, but no, I'm not familiar with it. So it's a study where they were studying video gaming and gaming and why, what people get out of it. And, and they listed um, 11 different needs that people can fulfill from playing video games. And I'm just going to list them all and then I want to have you guys um, introduce yourselves and, and tell me your reaction to this. But one is gaining knowledge, of course, gaining and improving skills, feeling competent, persevering through hard times, creating tools and managing danger, regulating emotions competing for rewards, cooperating for rewards, caring for loved ones, and satisfying senses. So, so that's what this study says people get, any mixture of those things out of gaming. Um, but before we get in uh, to some of my questions, I'm going to have you guys all introduce yourself, and um, I'd love you to say you know, who you are, where you live, and approximately how many hours a week you spend gaming. So Barry, we're going to start with you. Sure. I'm Barry Figgins. I'm in uh, California, near Sacramento. Uh, lately I've been pl spending maybe 15 to 20 hours a week gaming. I kind of got back into XCOM, so whenever I do that, it takes 5 or 10 hours a day. Uh, okay. Maybe less than that, but... Okay, and Jackie... I'm doing it while doing other things. And running your business, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Jackie. Oh, you're muted. Just unmute. Okay. Now it's better. Um, I'm Jackie McKinney. Um, I live with Barry outside of Sacramento, um, and I probably spend anywhere between three to eight hours a day gaming. So, I don't know. I've got Dragon Age to go through. And okay. Guild from Dragon Age to go through. <laughs> All right, Joe. Uh, I'm Joe. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and moving to Boulder soon. Um, I don't actually spend a lot of time gaming. I used to probably spend three to five hours a day. Um, at this point, I probably spend that much a week, so it's not not heavy usage. Okay, Kelly. My name's Kelly. I'm in Stockton, California. Uh, until recently, I would probably say I treated gaming like a full-time job. Nowadays, I'm playing maybe like an hour a day. Uh, yeah, I'm a minimum wage slave. And that's Siobhan in the foreground there, who does not game at all. None? Every other year I get into one game for, like, the subway ride. Like, like words no with Facebook friends. games, no Facebook games or anything like that? Just, like, words with friends or, like, a something absurd with the, the little alligator that, that gets down the water pipe. That one was cute. <laughs> <laughs> but it lasts, like, my interest lasts, like, one month every couple years, so. And then you're done. Okay. Yeah. All right, Samantha. Hi, my name is Samantha. I work in public interest research. I'm a younger millennial, and I kind of go through cycles with games. I have something like 1,500,000 like Steam hours that I have to get through for my pile, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I put in just under 700 hours into Skyrim. So <laughs> there, there's a lot that, that, I, that I cycle through when I get into those time periods, and right now, because I'm in school and working, I, I haven't been gaming nearly as much, though I am proud to say that I started a new phone over Christmas break, and I'm already at, like, level 200 in Candy Crush. Oh, goodness, Candy Crush. If you ever invite me, I'm unfriending you, okay? I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> okay, all right, so... Um, so uh, last time we talked a little bit about the rewards you get from gaming, especially when it relates to community, um, but I wanted you guys to tell me individually, like give me an example of something that, I mean, it's very Pavlovian, 
but what are the what are the rewards that, that make you feel any one of these 11 things I named or other things and what are, I'd love to have an example of a good reward something that um, like okay if I play trivia to crack against a really really smart person it's a much bigger reward than one of my dumb friends who I you know, <laughs> like the floor with so so I'd love to hear examples of good reward versus games where the reward just is like meh it doesn't do it for me that's why I'm not into it Barry well my example is sort of the same which is that uh, I'm addicted to checklists you might say um, one of the rewards I get when playing games is that Kind of to cycle back a bit, as you mentioned, I run my own business, and success there is very nebulous. Sometimes a day has ended, and I don't know if I've actually made any progress or not. So playing a video game, you know, I've always got a list of quests, a list of things to do, and I can just chop them off. I did that. I'm now stronger. I did that. I'm now stronger. Of course, the downside to that, the negative example of that, is games like uh, Assassin's Creed, where sometimes I can just get addicted to chasing down sheets yeah. of paper, catching pigeons, whatever crap they want you to do in the latest game. And But it doesn't feel like a reward when you get there? No, it's, it, can, it can become work. I mean, it's something that I'm doing just to increase my percentage and get it done. I'm doing it just because it's in front of me, but it doesn't feel rewarding so sometimes. It's a tour. Okay, so Samantha, who's shaking her head frantically... Go ahead. So, okay, so there is a, a DLC, so downloadable content, that came out for Skyrim where you get to build your own house. And literally, for the first, like, 15 hours that I got this, I was like, I'm going to build it, like, like wall by wall. I'm going to do this, and I'm literally, like, gathering everything. And, you know, like, literally halfway through, I think, my first house, I was like, I'm so done. Like, get get my little Jarl to do all this, I'm just going to get the bear skins, like, I'm done, <laughs> this is over. And so, like, that feels like work. Comparatively to when you get to, like, the quests and you see how you're building up and building up and building up, like, that's different. Like, that feels like you have, like, worth in the game, comparatively. Wait, I have to ask you this again. How many hours a day do you spend gaming? I don't game right now. Like, I, I don't have time for it. But in the past, I, I yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Joe, do you want to say anything about rewards that work and rewards that don't? I mean, for me, you mean, like, I guess I would answer that to say that um, for me, gaming has always been um, an exercise in creative problem solving. I just, it helps me rethink about how things get done or how logic works. Um, you know, and so, I mean, kind of like Barry, actually, I sometimes I definitely have that moment where I'm like, oh my goodness, this is totally work, because I've you know, been spending all this time on a thing that I don't doesn't even go anywhere, so I get frustrated with that, but the, the positive rewards, I think, are really often, like, for me, are like, oh, I I've never thought about something in a particular way, and now I get a chance to think about it differently, so I really, I really get a lot out of that, that, that part of it. Okay, Kelly? Tell me, like, tell me the game that rewards you the most, and one that the reward is not, it doesn't even move the needle. Um, well, currently I pretty much, I play like two games, which is League of Legends or Civilization V. Um, League of Legends can be very rewarding because it's like, um, it's, it's essentially like playing a sport. Uh, where you have a team, and if you win a game, you win a game, and that feels very good because you did things correctly and achieved victory. Um, I guess, and the thing is, is that it's been rewarding because it's also taught me ways to deal with things like failure in life, um, not achieving goals, and and sort of sort of you can apply things that you learn in that game to real life situations like. Um, it just in general team building and working on a team, but uh, I guess the, the downside is that you just have to put in the hours to to get anywhere with that. When when Samantha was talking, I was thinking about World of Warcraft a lot, um, which I know is is a big one in terms of addiction in general. And remembering when they started applying achievements, and Barry was talking about checklists. Um, achievements in World of Warcraft were literally things that didn't get you anything. Or at best, they got you something cosmetic, uh, but they didn't really serve a purpose practically. But you get people, and, and I definitely for a little while when they first came out was one of these, that were just like, I ha I'm going to put 
40 hours a week into making sure I clear these achievements because I need them. And I think that was one of the, the bad things about it is that you start developing instead of a, I want to complete this for fun is, like Sam said, I need to complete this and I can't even say why I need to complete it, but it goes from a want to a need. And that can become incredibly unhealthy because that's when it slips into addiction. So, so, um, hmm. So, with your War of Worlds, is where are you? Are you? You're not in addiction mode now because you're playing one hour a day. I'm not even. I'm not even playing World of Warcraft at this point. Oh. Uh, it got it got pretty boring for me, but uh, a big part of that was just that the game went downhill in general. It became less fun to play than it was. Okay. Um, All right. But so yeah. Well, I do want to. I want to go back to like when does a game go downhill? Like, what uh, is the trigger? Is it because the games change? Is it because you accomplish everything and now it's boring because there's no more challenges? Is it? it I mean, there, there's a lot of things. It's it's a long. It's a conversation for another day. But essentially, a patch <laughs> came out that kind of ruined it. And that's the that's the short story. Is a patch came out that really ruined a large aspect of the game for me, and then I found it very easy to stop playing. I mean, there's other reasons to stop playing series, too. Like, Mass Effect 3 had a horrible ending. And I mean, like, it's going to take me a while to ever forgive Bioware for its unfortunate, unfortunate ending. So, I mean, like, there's things like, <laughs> that happen like that where people actually hold on to, like, deep-seated hatred towards, like, certain designer companies because of what they've done. And I'm, like, the only person who was okay with the Mass Effect 3 ending. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to say that... Uh... Wait, no, no, I want to hear about it. I want to hear about the ending and why you hated it, Samantha, and why Jackie's okay with it. I I have spent so much time... Oh, wait, you got to tell us? Okay, go ahead. I have spent so much time with Mass Effect. I literally have loved it since its creation. It was fantastic. A wide range of characters. Bioware did a fantastic job when it comes to its relationships and the choices you can make. And I was really invested in my shepherd, who was the main character. And... Uh, I play him as a he, and his love relationship with Tally, who is, yeah, just fantastic. And essentially what happens is like, you spend all this time working on this character and having them, like, save the world only to be given, like, three different lights at the end, and it's basically the same thing. And I was like, I spent all this time making sure that, you know, I was playing you as a paragon. How dare you do this to me? And so that. I was very upset, and there was a small faction of us who were incredibly upset. Okay, so Jackie, why was it not upsetting to you? I guess because, like, so I played Shepard as a girl, which may have had a difference with it, because Tally, I guess, won't totally go into you if you're a girl, which is kind of annoying. Um, and super annoying, because I was totally all upon Tally, so fine, Tally, I, I can understand. Rejecting me just because I'm a girl and all. Like, everything else in my life. Like, real-life experience, right, and, Jackie? Uh, I was kind of hurt. Um, so I decided that if Tally doesn't want me, I'll go my own way, and I'll, you know, carve out my own section of space. And then so, you know, it's like watching Mass Effect, I didn't, I mean, I played the games, but I'm not like this hardcore, when it comes to Bioware games and like Mass Effect and Dragon Age, which are very similar gameplay styles, I, I'm not ready to tap a vein just to have an IV for these games. Um, because I know people who will like replay Mass Effect 2 like a hundred times, and I'm like, Guys, I played through the story once. I'm, I'm good. Um, and so when Mass Effect 3 happened, it's like the ending made sense. And from a from like a creative... I, I, ha I have my degree in creative writing, so I understand how a story is supposed to be crafted and everything. And from a craft perspective and from the philosophical and just sort of like other things they were drawing into Mass Effect 3, I'm like, the, I will admit the ending felt a little short and sudden at times. But in general, it was you know, it, it made sense from a philosophical and religious viewpoint. So I was, I was, you know, so, you know, like, I was like, that's how that ending is. And of course, when you have a very open-ended ending to a video game series, like, the ending I got may have not been the same one that Samantha got, and, you know, the one that I got, I was perfectly happy with. Like, it, it made sense. That world has ended. And now I'm hoping that when Mass Effect 4 does come out, that they'll start something new. 
And I think that's a very crucial point, is that because there's so many ways that you can play within Bioware games, you could have multiple endings, and that's why there was only a small faction, and it's really the tally faction that's very upset about Mass Effect. All right, so tell me what it feels like when a game ends, good or bad. Is there can an... I, can I weigh in here on a, a third point of view on that game? Because there's another point to be made that... Um, both uh, Jackie and Samantha are related to their personal experiences with the game and how the, the ending they got affected them, but the large portion of us that were really annoyed with the ending weren't annoyed with the ending, but the endings. The fact that no matter how you played it, no matter the, the unique choices you made, uh, like 80% of people were going to get the red light then 15% of people were going to get the blue light, and 5% of people were going to get rigged. the green light. It was like rigged. It and, didn't matter. Well, well, well that's and, kind of the thing. The illusion of choice fell apart. Yeah, exactly. Which, which was thematically completely disingenuous to the story. Um, the entire thing was about choice, was about not only that, but it was also about um, a character overcoming xenophobia to bring people together, and the entire thing is about him, the, the only decision he has is basically mass genocide. Um, which is, once again, completely thematically against the entire story. Um, but the point being that, yes, like, like Samantha just said, there's tons of choice, there's tons of different ways things go, and then, essentially, what it says at the very end is all the choices you made mean squat. Yes. Okay, I get it. So it's like predestined it's rigged, and it was like tricking you into thinking you had choices, but in the end, you felt like you really didn't have any choices. That it was all. Yeah, it was just the, the same three, the same cinematic with different colors. Jackie, were you going to say something? I'm just like, and that's exactly what life is. I mean, you make, I mean, and that's that's kind of the 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 inner depth of why I have depression, among other things, but besides getting on that, I mean, you make a thousand decisions in your life, but you all know, I mean, you know at the very end you're going to die. Like, you're all predestined to die. So it's like making all these millions and millions of choices don't really matter in the, you know, vague th sense of things. So that's, I think uh -huh. that's why the ending probably made a lot of sense to me, is that, you know, you know... Because you're a fatalist. <laughs> so yeah, The final decision just comes down to mass genocide, and it's like, you know, people are like, but I made all these decisions, and it's like, well, that's that's what happens sometimes. Huh. So, okay, wow. All right, so tell me this then. Does anybody else want to weigh in on that? That was fascinating. Um, because I played a lot of multiplayer. What? I played a lot of multiplayer. That was most of my experience with Mass Effect 3. <laughs> so that was good. Um, so tell me what is it like, when, even when a game ends well, like you're satisfied with the ending. I mean, the only thing I can associate with it is if I read a book that I absolutely love, right? Like I loved War and Peace. I know people bitch about that book for because it's so big. But I love that book, and when it was over, I mean, I can name a bunch of books in my life. It was like, I miss the characters, I want to know what they're doing, I'm like longing for this book. I mean, I've read some Jane Austen books like 15 times, you know. Um, <laughs> so so is it does it feel like that when a game ends, even if it's a good one? Fallout 3. But... It, <laughs> Is it always that you miss the game if it was a good game? No, no, like you don't always miss the game. Like sometimes, sorry, Kelly, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just making a comment. <laughs> well, okay, go, so yeah, like, you have to go. So like so for fun. me, uh, like big ones that I got into were like Bioshock, and like when Bioshock ended, uh, like Infinite was fantastic, and so like basically for me that was it was tossed in a bow, and I was like. I'm good. I can walk away from this series knowing that I am happy with how it all went, and it will forever be in my, like, back pocket as, oh, yeah, I love that game. But, like, that's it. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play it over again. Closure, and you're good, and it's like, okay. Yeah. Does anyone, does everyone feel like that when games end? But it's not well, all games. Like, that's, that's, you have to look at the games individually, too. Oh, okay. When, okay. Does anyone feel that feeling I was talking about at the end of a great book? Like, I miss it, I want it to continue, it can't... Okay, Jackie, go. Well, I, I totally get that feeling. I understand that feeling because I'm also a huge reader, so I totally get that, you know, feeling of, like, oh, my God, what happened to these characters and stuff? 
Um, and so I got that same feeling with Fallout 3. Um, you know, you, you, play the, you play the main storyline and then it just ends. And I was like, but no, what happens? What happens to the rest of the world? And luckily they put out some DLC, but then, you know, you play all the downloadable content and then you're still sitting there being like, this isn't enough. And even though they've released, like, Fallout New Vegas, I'm still, like, like, no, I need Fallout 3. I need more of that. I need, yeah. I need 12 more games or, like, 8,000 more DLC. It's like Downton Abbey when it ends. I'll feel the same way. Um, okay, that's I get that. All right, so let me ask you this, then. I'm going to shift it a little bit. So part of the reason that I'm interested in this as a marketer I mean, I'm just fascinated in any industry that grows so fast and because becomes such a big part of our culture, because it really is, um, is is that uh, that there are companies that try to use gamification to to elicit the same sort of um, not addiction but dedication to a program. You know, um, all sorts of mobile loyalty and loyalty programs are trying to base themselves on something like this. Like the only one I ever liked is McDonald's Monopoly. You know, when you get the little things and you stick them on the card. Um, is there any marketing reward program that that you love at all that you say I'm going to go back there because this is part of the fun of being like. Samantha, if, if Sephora had something where you you gained a reward for the amount of times you gave out advice or whatever, is there, I mean, the answer might be no from everybody, but is there any loyalty or reward system that a brand is using that is not a gaming brand that makes you want to go back? Okay, but the thing is, Sephora actually does this, so this is why I spend so much money in them, and it's awful. You guys awful. don't know this, but she is, like, so addicted to the, the community of Sephora, not just the brand. Okay. So for every dollar you spend, you get a point. And then eventually you go through the ranks. You start off as just a beauty insider. And then you become a very important beauty insider. And then eventually you're a VIB Rouge, which is where I am. And then you start accumulating these points. And then you buy things with these points. What's above you? There's nothing. I've reached it. I've reached the pinnacle of where you can go. It's, yeah. Okay, so you can buy product. Is that the reward, or is there a yeah. reward because then, you're a be rouge or whatever? Exactly. And so, like, okay, so this is this is really sad. But we've been stalking, essentially, this reward. We knew that there was going to be a Marc Jacobs lip reward this week. And so all of me and my, like, VIB rouges w literally were, would give each other, like, updates about, oh, now it's, it's offline, it's still offline. And as soon as it was online that we could get it, swarms because we had been stalking this reward for weeks. What was weeks. it? It's it's literally it's like Mark Jacob came up with a, a with a lip product that was new and supposed to be the creamiest lipstick you'll ever have. And and it's in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and we all wanted it and it we swarmed. Huh Okay, I've got to do. I've got to create something like this to get you to write blog posts every day. That would be great. So, so okay. So that but that's a great example of it. I mean, does anyone else personally? I, I mean, Starbucks reward I used to love because I loved Starbucks, and so I would oh, get one every fifteen drinks, and then they changed it on me, and I was annoyed. But I don't know that I've been sucked in by rewards. Does anybody else have something similar where they sort of earn? earn you're really talking about earning status too, right? Like like airplane, um, if you fly a lot, you know, air miles might be like that. But does any there's not another reward marketing program that anybody's been touched by? Nothing that I've been touched by, but the only thing I can think of is like Pepsi points. And like I see Pepsi points and I kinda wanna like do Pepsi points, but I don't drink enough Coke in general, whether it be Coke, Pepsi, whatever. I don't drink enough soda to like start up doing Pepsi points. But I'm like every so often I flip over the cap, the cap, and I'm like, wow, you know, if if I was into this, I could probably have a lot of neat stuff. Oh well, and then now goes the cap. So. So Barry, wait. NPR's Planet Money covered something recently that sounds very similar. A special sneaker, what the LeBron Ten, I think, and the sneakerheads who love them. So what do you get? Uh, uh well, in that one, what you get is the sneaker, but it's it was like a limited release. You could only you could only buy one, and you know people were lined up around the block. Some of them to get it themselves, some of them to sell it on eBay later. Um, but yeah, it just sounded very similar about 
a limited release that the people in the know are circling around the block to, you know, be the first to pick up. Okay. All right. So anybody else? Because I'm going to move on. Um, and oh, oh, this is this is Joe's question. So Joe, I might have to I might have you restate it if I'm not articulate in the way I ask it. But but Joe and I were talking about this before um, the hangout about can you is there a difference in your experience when you're playing a bot versus playing a human, right? Joe, is there more to that question, or is that it? Oh, no, I mean, I was thinking about, like, how, uh, you know, how, like, when you start, like, a, a game, you'll often get the quick tutorial, and if it's really good, it's, a, it's like the real game. It's just get a little, like, actual, you know, kind of walk through how it works. And, like, when that's gamified, which sometimes happens, and it gets sort of stolen for other things, too, like, I don't know, I, I sort of like that, but I, was, I guess what I was wondering is if, if people feel like there's a real difference in like, like playing against actual people versus a bot or whatever other part of the game is, you know, gamified or not gamified for loyalty. Is that the way you say it? I thought it was gamified. Uh, okay. So anyway, anybody? Well, I suppose I'll say that uh, when I do multiplayer, I pretty much exclusively play against the computer. I don't like to play against human opponents. Um, You're too good for the humans. <laughs> no, just I don't like being insulted. Um, yeah, a lot of times I don't like the competitive communities. And in kind of a selfish way, I like to win. And when it's a when it's a player versus player game, that's always a zero sum game. One side wins, one side loses. But when it's uh you know, I mentioned Mass Effect three multiplayer, that is a team of four players versus a bunch of computers. And with that, everyone on the team can win, and I feel a lot of like sportsmanship and teamwork with that. So that's really interesting. Let's go there. You know about the community. We it wasn't supposed to be part of this discussion, but what? What, Cal? I, I got something to say on that when uh, when you talked about that. Um, what, when Barry was talking about uh, the teamwork and coordination, but one side wins, one side loses, it brought me back to uh, the early days of World of Warcraft. So when that game first came out, there was open world player versus player, and basically what, what happened was later on in, in later expansions, people got to a point where the, the top end players were so far above uh, the nearly top end players that is the game developers basically had to figure out ways to, to keep the top end players from going into the zones with lower level people and just ruining the experience for anybody trying to level up. Um, but when the first, the very first vanilla uh, World of Warcraft was out, your top-end players weren't really that much more, like, you could have a mid-level person be effective. And so you'd end up in these, like, to me it was the most fun thing that ever happened in that game, was these impromptu server-wide battles that would happen in a random place where you'd get two, three hundred people in the same place going at it, and you know, and it all starts with two people having a little skirmish, and then you say, "Hey, there's an alliance guy over here. Bring, bring the, bring the level 60s. Okay, we're on our way." And then their side is doing the same thing. They say, "Oh, we found a, a group of people here. Bring some back up. There's too many of them." And then all of a sudden, it it erupts into this big war. Uh, that was probably the most fun player versus player experience ever because realistically, that was the one experience where one side doesn't win and one side doesn't lose. It just goes on until you're done, and then you log yeah. out and you you leave. So okay, I get that. I want I want to just ask about what Barry said though when he said I don't like to be insulted, right? So well, and that was because you um, you couldn't communicate with the other team, and because there was no general organization. It was literally just people piling in. Uh, it ended up being afterwards everybody goes back to whatever they were doing the next day and goes, man, that was awesome, wasn't it? Yeah, I had tons of fun. Oh, man, do you see how we took down that one guy? He had this piece of armor and that weapon. He was so powerful. I'm amazed we took him down so many times. Yeah, we totally shut that person down. It was awesome. Um, in in the flip side to that, I play a lot of League of Legends, which is very competitive, and I understand exactly what Barry's talking about. Uh, people have talked about how toxic that community is um, to no end, and the devs have come up with the tri like 
you know, half dozen different systems to try and curb the toxicity because people can get really, really insulting. However, uh, what I took away, I talked about this earlier, was that it also helps you because I don't think that is exclusive to video games. Uh, people are passive aggressive in real life. People will put other members of a team down all the time and they will call people out as weak links rather than bringing them up. Um, people like to blame other people rather than taking responsibility for their own misgivings and own faults within a team. But, and there is, but there's a level that the internet provides with anonymity, which I can never say. Anonymity. Whatever. That, and this happens in social too, and this is like that that happens that can happen in gaming because of that anonymous stature. So people become more. I mean, these things do happen in real life, but you know, I'm fascinated by um, the two sides of the community. The one Barry spoke of, where he'd rather play a computer because he doesn't want to be insulted, and then what Ryan talked about last week, where he didn't want to go to sleep because he felt like he'd be letting down members of his team. Right, and so at what point is the community addicted? Because you know he does these first shooter games, right, <laughs> Joe, mm -hmm. where he's on a team and he's he can't leave because they'll be weaker without him, right? Okay, but so, then that's that's a built-up community. So like often when you you work together, that is a community that that is literally constantly giving each other advice and how to where to, like giving guidelines on where to go. And I mean like there's reasons why. Uh, there have been like companies that have used Call of Duty to like inspire the way that they work, because like that builds teammanship. But at the same time, if you play as like a single and you're like trying to get into teams, you're gonna find like, a bunch of 13 year olds who have dirty mouths who are gonna say some really horrific things to you, and that's separate because you're not looking at it as a team. They're literally using it as as a means. Uh, of not creating that cohesive environment. So those are two different types of, of examples of how you would get there. Well, and I mean, I think that the other thing that's, and this is a lot harder to isolate, but <clears throat> um, we, we, as humans, we're, we're bound, as Kelly says, obviously, like we, you know, this is a full spectrum of, it's not surprising that a full spectrum of people would show up, like, to... To gaming, because that's the internet, that's the whole world in general. Like, there's lots of positive, and positive and negative. I think what is not as as easy to tell is what community gets built up really early in the early days of a game, and because once you get to a certain level, then you have practices and standards and expectations. But if you just throw out a game with like zero constraints for people, like they're going to be shitty. I don't know how else to say it. Like, it's just part of the environment. But if you if you create some elements or features or, or, or things that sort of encourage people to collaborate, to do the cooperative stuff, um, and then you know you de-incentivize some of the worst awful stuff, like you'll create a community that then will police itself over time. But you can't just throw that out there and be like, our thing is so awesome that like everybody will be good to each other or not. Like it's it takes a lot of thought, and I I don't know how much of that happens when they build a completely new, like, insanely large game like Civilization or Assassin's Creed or whatever, but it doesn't happen by itself. It's like Lord of the Flies, right? I think so. I mean, hey, it well, kind of... Okay, so we're going to go to addiction. Um, not that we haven't been touching on it, but the American Medical Association does not recognize video game addiction as a mental disorder, <laughs> although there is lots of discussion in the psychiatric and psychology community about it. Samantha, why are you frowning? Because when I said that to you before the Hangout, you were like, what? Well, okay. So it, I think that we have to look at addiction in a... Like, there... Okay. Psychologically, we have to look at addiction in multiple levels, and the reasons why we have to do this in a very interesting way when it comes to gaming is that a lot of the things that come out of gaming come out of certain... Uh, the chemical elements of gaming that are, come out in addictions are the same as gambling. And, yes, but, and, and wait, Ryan actually talked to me about this earlier. So Ryan, who is super smart and has two degrees from MIT, was telling me that dopamine... It's not an endorphin. It's actually yeah. dopamine that's released. He called that the little cousin of endorphins. Is exactly the same as the gambling um, yes. dopamine that's released. So even if you're not winning cash like you are a racetrack, you're getting a physical chemical reaction to the reward, right? Yes. 
And but the way we also have to look at that as gaming or not gaming gambling as an addiction is often still not really regarded heavily within the psychology community, and there's reasons for that. Uh, so it's like that's why yeah we get into this fuzzy psychology thing. So um, so do any of you think that you're addicted to gaming? And how do you even define that? Kelly's shaking his head. Yes, but Kelly, you, you quit when you got a wonderful girlfriend who makes you do other things. Um. Well, but the thing is, is that regardless of whether or not I'm keeping busy, that doesn't mean that I don't sometimes just feel a desire to sit down and have a day of just binge gaming. Um, I think that, that there's definitely, definitely a kind of... I, you know, it's like I say I was addicted to World of Warcraft. I hate the way it went, but that doesn't mean that I don't eventually end up buying every expansion and playing it for at least 20 to 40 hours before I just re remember why I quit in the first place. I think smokers go through the exact same thing, is once a year, pick up a cigarette, have a cigarette, and go, oh yeah, that's why I quit. But they still got to pick it up. They still got to go buy that pack. Uh, and... Alcoholics have to, it's even worse for, for people like alcoholics or gamblers who, you know, if an alcoholic go, falls off the wagon, the it, it's like they say, is you never, ever actually get over it. You never yeah. stop being an addict. You just deal with it. Okay. So, so what is an addict? Like, I mean... What what is there an is it based on hours played? Is it based on It's based on putting things that you should be doing on the wayside. Mm -hmm. Um and I mean that's it's the same for anything. Just think about anything anybody can get addicted to. I mean you can get addicted to if you're doing drugs, right. it's you're saying like I'm gonna do drugs instead of eating. I'm gonna do drugs instead of sleeping. Uh, people get addicted to working out. The, I'm going to skip work today and go hit the gym. Uh, same thing with video games. You hear about this all the time, especially World of Warcraft was huge on this. Whoa, wait a second. Jackie, Jackie just said there was that Korean couple that let their baby die because they were playing StarCraft. Oh, so I, many, so many. Wait, American yeah. did that too with yeah, World of Warcraft. Well, it wasn't a Korean slur, but wait, Jackie, tell me the story. So there's a story, a story about like it was like a South Korean, I believe it was a South Korean couple, um, in South Korea. Um, you know, it's I'm not, you know, trying to be, you know, and as Kelly pointed out, there um, were plenty, there were plenty of, um, there's plenty of probably American stories too. I just remember when it came up, it was in all the newspapers about this South Korean couple had, I can't remember if it was a newborn or if it was like a six month old baby or something. But the mom and dad were so focused into playing, I think it was like StarCraft or it was some massively multiplayer online game that they actually neglected the child to death. Like the kid starved or, you know, I don't know how babies die. Um, but basically, you know, a, that's what happened. And so, and there's, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, there's other, there's plenty of other examples where, um, Basically, you know, probably American couples or, you know, where they have a kid and the kid ends up dying or being super neglected because the parents are so focused into a world of Warcraft or... Yeah, and well, you know, I thought about it when Ryan said um, last week that, you know, when he first, when his kids were young, there was some game, one of these shooter games in his community, and his wife was just furious at him because the kids needed to go to sleep and she needed his help, but instead he was playing this game and he couldn't stop playing it and he stayed up till God, like, 4 o'clock in the morning and couldn't leave, and that is, to me, like, that's an addiction, right? Like, yeah. so, 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 okay, one of the definitions is uh, basically shirking responsibility, but how, I mean, when we talked about why you game last week, like, for Susan, it was stress relief, right? So where's the line between I want to game for four hours a day because my job is so stressful and I don't have to think and I get all of these other rewards, right? Um, where's the line? How do you guys, if you're all gamers, define it? Well, I, I talked about earlier when it goes from a want to a need. I mean, that, that's a big thing, and I think that's, yet again, when you talk about something like, for example, alcoholism. Uh, an alcoholic isn't a person who wants to drink. An alcoholic is a person who feels like they need to drink. It's the same thing. Is uh, 
and and I've seen it too. Where um, in high school, actually, there was a guy that was hardcore into World of Warcraft, and if he didn't get into his raid that night, he'd come to school physically ill with the shakes. Like it, it looked like he was going withdrawal with through withdrawal symptoms. And um, the only thing I can think is, you know, we talked about it's a dopamine. Ah, uh, thing. You, it's just you know, pleasure center of your brain. And we talked about it last week too, where uh, it's all about. Let's say shit in your life isn't going so well. Then all of a sudden you're playing a game and you're achieving something. And even if it's virtual and it doesn't actually have any effect on the real world, you have officially achieved something. So it fulfills that need in your life, whether or not that that's good for you or not. Yeah, that's, that's like validation, right? Self-worth and validation, which are needs, right? If you go back and look at psychology, those are core needs right after eating and drinking and sleeping. It's like being validated and feeling worth something, um, which totally happens in gaming. So. Sure. I mean, more than it does with drugs and alcohol, right? They're more like numbing. And it very, might be more potent, yeah. Barry, so you work, I know, you, I mean, you work in gaming, basically. I mean, you make a product for gaming, right? Sure, yeah. And I'm assuming that a huge portion of your friends are gamers, right? Mm -hmm. So is, is this addiction something that you see often? No, I wouldn't really say it is. Um, I'm trying to think back through some examples, but I can't really think of one where I thought a friend was addicted. Um, How about your wife? Yes. <laughs> no, she said she okay. plays every waking hour. <laughs> yeah, but she gets what she needs to do done. Well, there there was a period of the like what the what the year or two years that I will not speak of because I was seriously into an addiction, um, you know, of gaming, and yeah, I mean, I don't think it went so far as to, like having the shakes, and I was still able to get things in my life in my life done, but. It was very much like I spent spent every moment thinking thinking about the game. I I, I mean everything was thought about that game about that game, and it was to such a degree that like my skin started breaking out really badly. Um, I was altering my sleep schedule so I could play the game, um, and like it was just a full blown kind of thing. How'd you fix it? Like so, you obviously recognized it, right? Which I think that you know. At the time, I didn't recognize it. People were pointing it out to me, and I had a lot of friends who didn't see it as anything. Um, and it never really... I think it fixed itself only because it was it was a multiplayer game, and the other person who was supposed to be my partner in the game, aside from being a toxic friend and having their own problems, eventually they just sort of dropped me because of their own toxicity. They were like, I'm, I wasn't... I don't know. Like, they're, they just... I wasn't good enough or something. And I was having such anxiety over it that I was actually just like, every time I would log on, I see them on, I didn't want to be on. So I just kind of stopped doing it. And it's like I slowly started to just come back to myself. So it was like self-preservation in the end. I wonder, like, what was that? I mean, there's no, the way you described it is sort of like, it's almost like you went into this other kind of reality, right, where you were sort of so focused on the game. Like, yeah. What was that like coming back from that? Or I mean, I don't know if I can ask that, but like, what did, how, did you feel like you hit a moment where you're like, okay, I'm back in the regular world or something like that? There was. Um, at, the t at the time, I was starting to, like, I think I'm trying to find other things to do in my life. And so I, um, I was already involved in martial arts, and I was starting to run. I can't remember. I was starting to get into running. And it was, I was running, I started, ended up running about nine miles a week. Um, yeah, about nine miles a week. And then um, I was also doing my martial arts, and I was doing a lot of other things. And it was just, it started becoming this whole thing of, like, I just didn't want to be associated with that game. And I don't even know what I really found in, my, found in my life to that made me decide, like, I would rather be in my life than in that game. Um, but it was just, it was just this kind of moment of, like, I liked working on myself, and I liked being with my friends that I was just able to kind of pull myself out of there. I so know. I totally get it. You know, it's interesting because running is something that I have been addicted to because there's, because there's a, a drug release. There's a chemical addiction once you get to a certain level with running. But in, amongst your friends, so you had friends that were noticing that they thought you had an addiction. Do people in gaming talk about it as an issue, or is it? 
not that prevalent that it's a conversation. Well, when I was addicted, the only person who really saw me being addicted was Big Chris. And I think that was really because he lived with me. But all my friends were like, you know, you're getting the laundry done, you're getting the dishes done, your house looks fine, and you're still going to work. Like, you're not addicted. Like, to them, you know, I was still living my life. But I think the idea of, like, quality of life was, is, was you know, my quality of life wasn't as good as, as, good as it could have been. Okay. Does anybody else, I mean, have stories to tell like that? I mean, I can so see how it's a different life. I guess it's not that you're not living your life, you're just living a very different life when you're when you're gaming like that, right? Samantha? No addiction? You sound a little crazy when you get all excited about so, stuff. So, I, I mean, I will say that there have been times where, you know, I'm going to go on an entire weekend where it's just me and three, you know, mm. things full of coffee and I'm going to power through like 25 levels and that's what I want to do. Um, I think also uh, I put a lot of money into my into my grad school program right now and it's, it's I'm also a newlywed, right? So it's like for me, my priorities shifted a little bit which was very odd because I, I used to be very big into gaming and like our our wedding present for each other was buying a PS4, and yet, like, I bought Wolfenstein, and I just haven't finished it. I mean, like, these are things that have happened, and uh, for a while, I felt really weird about it, and I think, like, now, now I'm trying to figure out, well, where is gaming going to fit into my life? Like, when can I fit those hours in? And I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, well, wait till you have kids. Those hours totally evaporate. No, 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 no. There will be mommy days. Mommy days where she is just, you know, I said, You'll be lucky to put it. that Sephora on those days. I'm just telling you. <laughs> very, I want to ask I, I'm, I'm really curious, and I don't know, maybe Sam or Jackie or if anybody else wants to pitch in. Like, I wonder, like, so what sometimes happens in addiction, and, you know, I, I don't know if I don't, I would say I've ever officially been addicted to gaming, but I've had other things where I get sort of obsessed. It's like, Sometimes you don't even see that you're in an interface, right? And, like, I think about this stuff a lot, obviously. But, like, I wonder, I sort of almost wonder, like, when you went down that road and it became super intense, like, did, was there a moment when you were like, oh, I'm dealing with an interface, and did that change the thing for you at all? Like, when you were kind of like, wait a second, this is just a game, and I need to take a moment. Like, Not that I can really recall. I mean, it was it was pretty much... And for mine, it was it wasn't a video game. Mine was um, it was a text RP game. So and I was interacting with other people, and so it was just. I mean, I think that was the other hard part is that I was actually interacting with other people. Um, so it was more like an addiction to people. Yeah, Joe, this is. We talked about Jackie. We talked about this. I was talking to Ryan earlier about this show and I said I'm not really addicted like I don't like to gamble I've been to Vegas a zillion times I don't even do it you know what happens like what happened with Trivia Crack with me is you know I'm really into it for a few days and there's a reward and then I get sick of it and he said are you kidding me you're totally addicted to social media and I said no it's not the platform I could care less if it's Facebook or Instagram it's the people it's the addiction to people and addiction to community and that's that's what I that's what I wondered like I, it's fascinating to me that, and I get why Barry says I'd rather play against the computer because of the negative aspects of the community, but I wonder, is community gaming far more addictive because really you're having relationships with people that you're addicted to, right? Yeah, I mean, my, my, I, have a friend, I have another friend who he totally admits that I get addicted to people. Like, that's just who I am. I get, and I'm not a vamp. I mean, I'm not one of those, like, emotional vampires where I try to suck out of people. It's, <laughs> just, it's just, like, I am so addicted to getting to know another person. Um, and just, and, I mean, it was probably a double-edged sword, too, because the thing I was on was, like, a role, it was a role-play game. And I got to take on a completely different person who, at the time, was way more confident, way more beautiful, way more professional than what I was in my current job. You know, I had this doesn't even hardly pay minimum wage crappy job, mm -hmm. and I was essentially playing this very gorgeous, you know, uh, executive assistant, and it was awesome, and I loved it. Um, and so you could interact with people as somebody else. Exactly. 
and they they all looked up to me as like a mother and a wife and all these really great things and you know I was I was the person they went to for advice kind of a thing and it was great and that's that's who I was and you know it, it gave me a sort of status sure but that's just what I loved about it is that I could escape from what was kind of my current sucky life at the moment and go be this, you know, one. No offense, Barry. Obviously, she wasn't married to you yet. <laughs> she was. It was. I mean, I can certainly go into it. It was a complicated time for her. Yeah, yeah. but that's so honest, and I so get it. Like that mm -hmm. makes sense to me. The being addicted to people and community and being someone else, and I mean, what a great escape, right? Yeah. So you know, and then it's like you get out of that, and then it's like I went back to my job shelving books. You know, yeah. putting away from my house, and I was like, "Wow, this is this is great." You know, like I would rather be that beautiful executive assistant, you know, for the multi-billion-dollar company than, you know, shelving books. <laughs> and that's yeah, no, I totally like that makes total sense to me. Um, Joe, well, I, let me hold on one second because I, um, well, that okay. So this leads into this question that Joe had. You know, um, so when you feel this. I mean, it's not really an addiction to people because I think, I think Jackie, like, okay, pre-gaming, what would you have done? I don't know, maybe go to gamer conventions that weren't to do with video games, you know, the other kinds of games we talked about. But um, because I think addiction to community is nothing new. It's all. It's why we live near each other. It's why we all don't live out in Alaska, you know. Uh, there's, okay, there's something. Go, Sam. I feel you. Okay, go. There's yeah. so much, something that's so much cooler about being a gamer and RPGs than it is to be a tabletop player. Like, God forbid I talk to someone about playing D&D &D and somehow I'm like, you know, a pariah. But if I we say that I do, like, multiplayer, people are like, oh yeah, I do that too, that's so great. Like, do you like shooting this alien race? And it's like, yo man, I'm very invested in my character and how dare you just, like, toss out all the work that I've done there. So, I mean, like, there's that. There's that element too, that it's, it's cool. It's cool to multiplayer, but it's not like it's not cool to tabletop. Okay, all right, Joe. What were you gonna say? You're muted, Joe. That's fascinating. Um, no, I mean, I was just gonna say, like, because Amy, we talked about this. Like, I remember there was a time when everybody thought that Second Life was going to be the future of everything, right? And it's like it's all gonna be virtual worlds. And now I'm sort of like ten years later, it's kind of not yet. And I, I guess I wondered, like if anybody had feelings about like what the future of gaming might be and or what you might you want it to be like like what kinds of things are not happening that you would like all right Barry the future of gaming um no about the 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 virtual I, I'm I'm so bad because I don't even know the trait terminology but the virtual world like 3D world right Joe like totally real virtual worlds versus what you have now, which Joe thought, he said in 2005, he thought that's what gaming was going to be, right? Yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, like, early early interpretations of the internet and, like, um, like, retail spaces, they thought that, you know, if you went to, like, but this was before Amazon, but if you went to an online bookstore, you would want to, like, enter the doors of a virtual bookstore and look around the virtual shelves and pull yeah, off a virtual yeah, yeah. book and look at it. And then we realized, no, we don't want any of that. We just want, like, you know, a list of books. Yeah, like, we can imagine what the store looks That is so fascinating because I remember buying one of these planning. I was in... I was doing an interior design type stuff. So I bought one of these planning things where you could build the whole house and walk around and look. And we thought, this is so cool. Like my friend, we actually designed her loft in Boston, right? No one uses that stuff now, so I totally get it. Joe, that, I didn't get what you were talking about. Like, so so in gaming, you don't want to really pretend and run around and look. and Like you're like, I know where I am. Let me just play the game. Is that what it's really like? Well, I guess virtual reality is uh, hopefully about to make a big upswing in gaming. I mean, we've got new virtual reality headsets coming out, and there's a lot of stuff um, based around that coming out. It'll be an interesting conversation to have in five years or so when we actually you know, have had these virtual worlds that are entirely immersive that you really can lose yourself in. You know, When those have been around for a couple of years, it'll be interesting to see the effects that has on people. I will need to avoid those. You want to avoid those? I need to avoid those. 
because you're worried about getting addicted to them? Yeah, because I should I should be in this world, not the other ones, because I would so rather be in the other one. That's so interesting. All right, so we have five minutes left, so I'm gonna be I'm gonna totally shift because I think Joe I had Joe did I miss anything you wanted to ask? All right, so I'm gonna give Little Miss Ranter Samantha a platform here because we talked about this earlier. <laughs> And I, okay, so so Samantha does work for ARC, um, different things. You know, she runs our Boomer Think Tank, and she blogs for us. And um, and she and Susan had this conversation that fascinated the heck out of me about um, sort of back to the hierarchy and who are the players inside of the uh, gaming world. And this fake geek girl, which Samantha has been accused of being, right? So go. Tell me what it is and tell me why it infuriates you. Okay, so here's the thing. If, uh, if you go to a convention and let's say I wear circa 2005 Civil War Captain America like shirt and I'm very proud of it because like Captain America during Civil War was like the best thing ever. People will look at me and be like, oh, you saw that Marvel movie and that's why you like Captain America because Chris Evans is so hot. And I will be like, no. First of all, Civil War is probably one of the most crucial things that ever happened to the Marvel Universe, and I don't think that you understand what, how that impacted myself. Second of all, I've written multiple, multiple academic essays comparing it to Just War Theory, and it's fascinating. So I'm going to go to town about this, but at the end of it, all they're going to take away is, I can't believe this girl came to this convention and she's why? just face. But why is it that you're, why are they thinking you're fake? Why? Why if somebody else Be, were to Because I, so, so here's the thing, like, because... There, there's an association with a hierarchy of being uh, ostracized by society when when you're a gamer. Like there, there's legitimately people who are ostracized for being gamers. Totally fair. And because of that, there's a community that's built on this understanding that people don't get us. And because I operate in another world and I'm widely accepted in another world, it seems like there's no reason for me to be a part of that community. Is this because you're cute and don't live in a darkened room? I don't get it. How would that be identifiable? Is that so? Jackie's shaking her head. Yes. Yeah. Wait, 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 stop, Jackie. Is it because she's cute and looks like she might be the executive assistant at a million dollar company or whatever? For some reason, there's me where I never get really picked on. Gaming conventions, normal life, nothing. I've never, you know, I've never had the problem of being catcalled or anything like that. So it's like, um, and pardon for some of my language, Samantha, for a minute. But yeah, she's adorable and cute, and I've not seen her in real life, but from this tiny picture I'm seeing on my screen, yes, A+, plus, gold star. Um, so yeah, she's the kind of girl where, like, if you would see her at, like, a gaming convention, comic book convention, yeah, she's totally the kind of girl who, you know, probably gets catcalled on the street and definitely, you know, you know would probably... Supposedly, there's suddenly risen in this in the culture this idea that if she wears a Hulk T-shirt or her the Captain America T-shirt, she's done that because she just likes Chris Evans or her boyfriend made her wear it or she got dragged to this convention. Whereas for some reason, me, I can totally go around walking in an Iron Man you know T-shirt. Which, mind you, I've just seen the movies, I've read Civil War, I've kind of touched it, but I don't know anything you know very much about it. People don't look two days at me, and I don't know. Like, why? I, don't, I find it very fascinating. That because I do, too. Wait, go, Sam. There's a personification of who ostracizes people within these communities. And I, I could look like I went to high school and was a cheerleader and blah, blah, blah. And I would be a part of that ostracized, like, the group that ostracized these individuals. From the yeah, I totally get it. I mean, honestly, I have this problem with someone online, and I and I got to, it's a social thing that's similar. And I said to Hesse, she'll never like me because in high school I was the cheerleader who got good grades, and she got she was super smart, but eff it and smoked and like was a goth. And like we're thirty years later, and it still feels like that. So I get it, but I also think this taps into like what Kelly talked about about, um, and I really thought about that a lot, Kelly, about how you talked about <clears throat> corporate America making nerd culture cool because they could make money. So it's like you're being tricked, right? It's like you really are legitimately nerdy, smart, you know, all the things that go with nerd culture have become popular, right? So then 
this cute, adorable person who could get catcalled would never have 20 years ago been part of that group. Now wants to be or is. I mean, this is it's all it's all visual. That's what kills me. So here's the interesting thing, Sam. When you're playing the game, nobody can see what you look like. You fit in. It's just in real life that you. Or look even like. when I published my articles after from Comic Cons that I went to, no one knows what I look like afterwards. Then and it's like, oh, that's a great article that came out. But as soon as they see my face, it's like, oh. Wait, Kelly. Why is Sam not the demographic you're looking for? Because she's already a gamer. No, because she's as stated before, a cute female, and anybody in gaming, I mean, this, this is actually something we didn't touch on at all, but anybody in gaming, uh, in nerd culture right now, does not believe anybody is involved in gaming or comic books or anything outside of the demographic of 13 to 28 year old male. And literally, literally, um, when you look at marketing reports, um, there are three games that currently exist uh, in regards to how marketers are creating video games. That's Clash of Clans, uh, Call of Duty, and I think it's... Shoot, there's another... Uh, Candy Crush. Can those are the three games. Those are the three games that matter. Those are the three games that all marketers and anybody that's involved in nerd culture right now, other than independents, care about or are looking at demographics or are looking at stats for. Because... That's all they think people are playing. And the problem is, is that, you know, like, like Sam said earlier about uh, washing the mouth out of the 13-year-old kids that play Call of Duty, uh, that's what the marketers think the only people that get into this are. So the reality is... is I don't know, Kelly. I don't know that that's what we think anymore. I mean, I'm a marketer, kind well, of. Well, are you marketing video games? That, that's the thing, is that right now the biggest problem is people that aren't involved in video games are running video game companies. And all they can do is stare at demographics, stare at uh, stat sheets, but they have absolutely no idea. And right now you're doing the proactive thing, which is having a think tank in which you're talking to people who play video games yeah. about... And, 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 and proclaiming... Probably actually use that information. <laughs> but the reality is, is that companies like EA... Companies like Ubisoft, why we hate these companies is because all they care about is the opinions of the 13-year-old boys. Okay, all right, we got to wrap up. conclusion, what? because she has a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to wrap up now. Um, but Okay, Joe, we'll talk about, we, we probably have to come back again, because you're right, that's huge. And thanks, and you know, Jackie, in particular, thanks for, like, for so much honesty. Like, I... I, I, I totally respect it. All right, so I'm going to hang up, but you guys can stay on if you want to hang out after I stop the live broadcast. Bye, everybody who's watching us.